In 1899, Pope Leo XIII issued his condemnation of the heresy of Americanism. It took the form of a letter to Cardinal Gibbons, the Archbishop of Baltimore. After a greeting, Pope Leo wrote, It is known to you, beloved son, that the biography of Isaac Thomas Hecker, especially through the action of those who undertook to translate or interpret it in a foreign language, has excited not a little controversy on account of certain opinions brought forward. Toward the end of the letter, Pope Leo concluded, We are not able to give approval to those views which, in their collective sense, are called by some Americanism. So Pope Leo condemned Americanism, and he mentioned its most notable promoter, Father Thomas Hecker, by name. Nowadays, Pope Leo's condemnation is simply dismissed by the modern church. We read in Wikipedia that Cardinal Gibbons and most of the American church immediately responded that neither Father Hecker, who had already passed away, nor American Catholics held any of the condemned views. Pope Leo's condemnation is dismissed by claiming that it was based only upon a poor translation of Father Hecker's biography. As always, I only cite Wikipedia as an example to show what is believed according to common knowledge. As you recall, the modern church also now dismisses the early suppression of the Divine Mercy devotion, saying that it was based upon faulty translations of Sister Faustina's diary. In this video, we'll take a closer look at Father Hecker and see whether there are any problems with his writings. Isaac Hecker was born in 1819 to an affluent Protestant family in New York City. He was interested in philosophy and spent his early years studying Kant, Fichte, and Hegel. He became a socialist and joined an organization called Genuine Democracy. From there, he joined a commune called Brook Farm, which was based on transcendental ideas. It tried to balance labor and leisure, and all people were paid equally, including women. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote of Brook Farm, saying that it was a perpetual picnic, a French Revolution in small, an age of reason and a patty pan. When the Brook Farm commune failed, Isaac Hecker then turned to Catholicism. But everyone has to start from somewhere, and the important thing is where we end up. With Father Hecker, though, we need to question whether any of his old beliefs were carried forward with him into his Catholicism. Father Hecker went on, in fairly short order, to be ordained as a priest, and then he was the founder of the Paulist Fathers, who specialized in trying to convert Protestants. He was known as an eloquent speaker. At the time, he was very well known, and in his time, he was probably the equivalent to what Fulton Sheen was in the 1940s and 50s. In regard to his new order, the Paulist Fathers, like Father Hecker, many of the priests were former Protestants. So the Paulist Fathers were to the 1800s what Catholic Answers is today. Pope Leo stressed the danger of these types of apostolates. The underlying principle of these new opinions is that in order to more easily attract those who differ from her, the Church should shape her teachings more in accord with the spirit of the age and relax some of her ancient severity and make some concessions to new opinions. Many think that these concessions should be made not only in regard to ways of living, but even in regard to doctrines which belong to the deposit of faith. They contend that it would be opportune, in order to gain those who differ from us, to omit certain points of her teaching which are of lesser importance, and to toad down the meaning which the Church has always attached to them. It does not need many words, beloved son, to prove the falsity of these ideas. And at its heart, Americanism is a subset of liberalism. Specifically, it is a Catholic adaptation to and a defense of the liberal principles set forth in the Bill of Rights. It was alleged that Father Hecker preached a peculiar form of Catholicism that was compatible with First Amendment liberalism. As Father Felix Sarda e Salvani wrote, They imagine with blinded good faith that they are defending and propagating Catholicity, but by dint of accommodating it to their own narrow views and feeble courage, in order to make it, they say, more acceptable to the enemy whom they wish to overcome, they do not perceive that they are no longer defending Catholicity, but a thing of their own manufacture, which they naively call Catholicity, but which they ought to call by some other name. Poor victims of self-deception, who at the beginning of their battle, in order to win over the enemy, wet their own powder and blunt the edge of the point of their swords. They do not stop to reflect that an edgeless and pointless sword is no longer a weapon, but a useless piece of old iron and that wet powder cannot be fired. But as noted earlier in this video, to this day it is alleged that Father Hecker was not a liberal, and it is alleged that the allegations were based on a bad translation. But let's see whether this is true or not. This is from Father Hecker's obituary in the Chicago Tribune. It says that Father Hecker was an ardent and proud American. He was living in Paris during the Second Empire and boasted to a French conservative. 
In America, we believe in a government of checks and balances. What check do the people have on Louis Napoleon? So it seems that Father Hecker promoted representational democracy over more conservative forms of government. He had large and clear ideas about the separation of church and state. Franklin, he said, was a free thinker, Washington some kind of Episcopalian, Jefferson a Unitarian, and brought at that, and Hamilton, we know not what he was, if of any religious belief. The Adamses were Congregationalists, and Charles Carroll was a Catholic. Yet there is no doubt that it was a legitimate government, now hardly second in power to any in the world, competent for the settlement of the greatest questions between church and state to the advantage of equity in religion. He quoted with a smile the remark of an old man that did not much care for the union of church and state, if he could only have the true union of the church and the people. However, in a syllabus of errors, Pope Pius IX condemned the proposition that the church ought to be separated from the state and the state from the church. And Pope Pius IX later wrote, Manifold evils in the world were due to the fact that the majority of men had thrust Jesus Christ and his holy law out of their lives, that this had no place in either their private affairs or in politics. And we said further that as long as individuals and states refused to submit to the rule of our Savior, there would be no real hopeful prospect of a lasting peace among nations. And Pope Pius concludes, When once men recognize, both in private and in public life, that Christ is King, society will receive the great blessings of real liberty, well-ordered discipline, peace, and harmony. Father Salvani explains, To the promoters of Catholic liberalism, the thing appears easy enough. It is admirable, they say, for the individual reason to be subject to the laws of God if it so wishes. But we must also distinguish between the public and private reason, especially in an age like ours. The modern state does not recognize God or the church. In the conflict of different religious creeds, the public reason must stand neutral and impartial. Hence, the necessary independence of public reason. The state of state can have no religion. Let the simple citizen, if he wishes, submit to the revelation of Jesus Christ. But the statesman and the man in the public life must comport himself as if no revelation existed. Now all this means civil or social atheism. It means that society is independent of God its author, that while individuals may recognize their dependence on divine law, civil society should not, a distinction whose sophism is founded on an intolerable contradiction. The belief that church and state should be separate is an error that was taught by Father Heckert. On the contrary, the church and state should work in concert to promote the social kingship of Christ, though each has different responsibilities. Father Heckert taught that religion should not be taught in public schools. He said, Catholics and Protestants both agree that in view of their parental responsibilities, they cannot send their children to other than positive Christian schools, but it is admitted by all that a state such as ours cannot teach or pay for teaching religion. Therefore, the defects of our public school organization must be remedied by amending it according to parental rights and consistently with American ideas of religious liberty. However, Father Salvani wrote, in regard to secular education, to gain a child is to secure the man. To educate a generation apart from God and the church is to feed the fires of liberalism and repletion. When religion is divorced from the school, liberalism becomes its paramour. Secularism is naturalism, the denial of the supernatural. When that denial is instilled into the soul of the child, the soil of the supernatural becomes sterilized. Liberalism has realized the terrific power of education and with satanic energy it is now striving, the world over, for the possession of the child. With what success we have only to look around us to realize. In its effort to slay Christ, it decrees the slaughter of the innocents, snatch the soul of the child from the breast of its mother, the church, says liberalism, and I will conquer the world. Here is the real battleground between faith and infidelity. He who is victor here is victor everywhere and it appears that time has proven Father Hecker wrong and Father Salvani is being absolutely correct. Since this is a video about liberalism and Americanism, we should also note the relationship John Henry Newman had with Isaac Hecker. Newman once wrote an article for Hecker's journal, The Catholic World, and later, after Father Hecker died, Newman wrote, I was very sorrowful at hearing of Father Hecker's death. I have ever felt that there was this sort of unity in our lives, and that we had both begun a work of the same kind, he in America and I in England, and I know how zealous he was in promoting it. 
It is not many months since I have received a vigorous and striking proof of it in the book he sent me. Now I am left with one friend less. So, Newman likened Hecker's work to his own. But since the Second Vatican Council, the Novus Ordo Church now believes what Father Hecker preached, so his legacy has been rehabilitated. In 2008, Cardinal Edward Egan of New York formally opened Father Hecker's cause for sainthood. So Father Hecker is now called Servant of God Isaac Thomas Hecker. Perhaps soon we'll see another sketchy saint. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll be back again within a week with another one. But in the meantime, please check out my Facebook page and my Twitter page. Every day I post additional content that you won't find on this YouTube channel. And also, please pray for the church. Freedom, 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 freedom.